Your life can change. It doesn't have to stay the same. You can break through to another level. You can experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower you to live beyond limits. And I want you to give a huge surge welcome to Johnny Jernigan as he comes and he ministers to us today. God bless you, Johnny. Hallelujah. Hey, can everybody stand with me, please, for just a moment? I know we just let you sit down. Can we give Jesus the greatest shout of praise we can today? Father, we bless you, we exalt you, we magnify you, and we place you on the high place. Amen, amen. Everybody remain standing. Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Make this faith declaration out loud. If you're online, you got to smile too. Everybody smile. Let me see it. Come on, say it loud. Say, I believe that God wants me to win. Come on, say it again. I believe that God wants me to win. Now, how many know if you tell a lie long enough, you will believe it? Come on. And how many know if you tell the truth long enough, you will believe it? Yes. And I declare this every time before I get to preach God's wonderful word. And I declare this to you and to your wonderful pastors. God truly wants you to win in every area of your life. He wants you to win in your family. He wants you to win in your business. He wants you to win in your faith. He wants you to win in your relationships. I heard somebody say a long time ago, Jesus is not coming back for a bunch of losers. Come on. He's coming back for a victorious church, a triumphant church, an overcoming church. And I hope you believe that today, that no matter what is hurting in your life and no matter what is broken, that you heard what Pastor Brad said just a moment ago, a young lady we met yesterday whose dad, her own dad, said to her, you're dead to me. Can you even imagine the grief that is in that little girl's heart today? Whatever hurts, whatever's broken, whatever is difficult in your life, God wants to wrap his arms of love around you today and love you and encourage you and that you'll know that God wants you to win. If you believe that, say, I believe. It is an honor, honor, honor to be here with Pastor Brad Pastor Mary. I love you guys. I've watched them literally grow up, and, uh, and it's a joy to be here. My name's Johnny. My wife Karen is over there. Would you hold your hand up, sweetheart? Everybody say, hello, Karen. I'm so glad she's here. But So you know my name. My name's Johnny, but I don't know all of you, so on the count of three, everybody tell me your name as loud as you can. Here we go. One, two, three. All right, now we know everybody. All right, I want us to pray for two things. First of all, I want us to pray for God's anointing. Everyone say God's anointing. The Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's not a, a wonderful worship team. It's not someone with, with a microphone. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And I need you to help me this morning. And I declare this every time before I preach. What's about to happen in this room? God wants to release something, and God, I believe, wants to speak to us. But what's about to happen is not all up to me. It has a lot to do with you. I need you to pray that God will anoint me to preach today. Come on. Because I'm praying God's going to anoint you to hear. Hallelujah. Uh, so everybody smile and say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. I hope you do. All right, so I need you to preach with me today. And, and here's the rules. If I say something that sounds good, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good. If I say something you don't like, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good. So hit the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. Go ahead, hit that person next to you and say, he's talking to you. All right, so let's believe for his anointing. Second thing I want us to pray for is an open heart. Everybody say an open heart. Listen, in these next three hours as I preach, I know that God is going to do something supernatural. <laughs> I just scared all the visitors, all right? No, uh, blessed are the brief, for they shall be heard again, all right? So we're going to get out on time in just a few minutes. But I don't know everything, but neither do you. And if you'll just open to your heart, to your great God, we're in his house today. We're with his people. And if you'll open your heart, God, I believe, wants to speak to us. So if you're comfortable, would you just lift your hands to heaven with me? If that's uncomfortable, would you just bow your head with us right now? Father, we thank you for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that's here in the sanctuary, those that are watching online. And we believe today, oh God, that as we have gathered here, that we have gathered to meet with you and for you to meet with us, almighty God. So Lord, wrap your arms of love around every person in this room, those watching online, that they won't be the same same when we leave in just a few minutes. They'll leave built up and edified and strengthened and better than they were when they came in today. And Lord, would you lift me above my abilities that if I say the wrong thing, help your people hear the right thing. And we believe for miracles and signs and wonders as we have gathered in your name today. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. And if you agree, everybody say amen. Hey, before you're seated, look at the person next to you right in the eyes and say, man, you look good today. Tell them just like that. 
Hallelujah. You can be seated. If you have your Bible with you, would you go ahead and open that to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. We'll look at this passage of Scripture in just a moment. Luke chapter 14, and beginning in verse 15. It was a, a, a story of a couple that lived in the cold of snowy Chicago, and they wanted to get out of the cold of Chicago because it was freezing in the middle of winter time, and they decided they were going to go down to sunny Miami Beach, Florida. And so because of the nature of their businesses, the husband and wife had to travel a day apart. So the husband went down to Miami, got there first, and when he got there, he wanted to email his wife and let her know that he had arrived. When he got there, he wrote the email but he missed one letter in the email address, and the person who did receive the email was an elderly woman whose husband was a minister who had died the day before. When she read the email, she let out a shriek and fainted to the floor. The children and grandchildren came rushing in, and they saw the email on the computer, and it said this, Dearest wife, made it here safely. Preparations are being made for your arrival tomorrow. Love your husband. P.S., it sure is hot down here. All right, now, I want you to know, I want you to know, we, we better get the details right. We better get the details right. What I'm about to preach to you this morning and share with you, I believe that if Jesus was here today, I believe this might be something that Jesus would say to us, and I, and I hope you'll receive it that way, because I'm going to read what's called a parable. For those that might not know what that is, that's a story. Jesus was an amazing storyteller, that he would tell a story to relate a kingdom truth. And so this is in red letters in my Bible, and if it's in red letters, who do we believe said this? We don't believe that these are the words of a translator. We don't believe these are just the words of an apostle. We really believe that these are the words that Jesus uttered. And he's painting a picture of what the end of time might look like. As we're sitting here today, it's hard for us to remember sometimes because it happened many months ago, but bombs literally are still falling in Israel while we're sitting in this room right now. And just this past week, our military was ordered to drop bombs on Lebanon and in Syria to go after attacks, those that are attacking our military and now Iran and Iraq and Lebanon are saying that they will retaliate now against the United States and against Israel. And if those nations attack Israel, how many of you know that brings the United States deeper into that conflict? And so we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We're waiting for the shoe to fall. Uh, what's really going to happen of the, after the atrocities of October 7th? that those many, many Israelites that were murdered and raped and killed right there in some of them of their own family, now Israel fighting back in the Gaza Strip. And we're deeply, deeply, deeply involved in that conflict. Which way will it go? Jesus said at the end of time, and the Word of God teaches us, at the end of time there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There's nothing new about this. He said there will be famine. I don't know if you know this, but you can go to the World Health Organization and you can see it for yourself that last year around the world, more people starved to death around the world than any time in recorded history. And yet we have more ways to get food to people today than any time in history. We have ships and planes and vehicles, and yet more people starve to death because in warring nations, and there are many warring nations, the food could not get to the hungry people, and people were literally starving to death around the world. The Bible says that there would be these natural disasters, that we're watching these tsunamis, we're watching these earthquakes, we're watching these uh, horrible uh, uh, natural disasters that are happening around the world. The Bible said when you see these things happening, know that the coming of the Son of Man is really, really close at hand. So today, as, as, a, as an evangelist today, and, and I, I am a pure evangelist, you have a wonderful pastor. Do you love your pastors? Come on, everybody. Do you love them? You have amazing pastors. But I am an evangelist, and I want to speak something into your heart. Every major prophecy in the Bible has been fulfilled except the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus and the rapture of the church. 
So we're, we're looking at these things, and we're looking at things that are happening so fast that we're watching, even in our own nation, the political process that is so chaotic. And you know what politics means? Poly means many, and ticks means bloodsuckers. All right? So we're looking at this process and all of these changes that are happening. And how many of you, like me, feel like everything is uneasy right now? Wave at me if you feel that way. And it feels like the whole world is upside down and right side up. And so I want to read something to you in a parable in Luke chapter 14 that Jesus was painting a picture of what the end of time possibly could be like. And you can read along with me. If you would, it's on the screen. You can read along with me. It says this. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Everyone say excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married and I, so I can't come. No explanation needed. Verse 21. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Listen now. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Pay very close attention, and I'd like for you to read this passage out loud. It's on the screen. Will you read it with me? Come on. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. The next verse says, not one of those who are invited to the banquet will get a seat at the banquet. Jesus is painting a picture in this story of what the end of time might look like. It's going to be a, a, like a banquet. And, and if the Bible says it's a great banquet, how many believe it was a great banquet? Come on. 45-pound butterball turkeys and corn on the cob and black-eyed peas and fried okra and cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread and tea. Just a wonderful, wonderful banquet. And everyone is invited to come and sit at the table with the king and feast with the king. Can you even imagine that? Can you imagine if the king of England now, King Charles of England, called you this afternoon or sent round-trip first-class tickets for you and your family to come to Buckingham Palace for the next three days, all expenses paid to find out what's happening with William and Kate and Harry and Meghan and all that's going on in the British Empire, and you get first-class round-trip tickets to go to Great Britain to sit with King Charles. If you got that in the mail, this afternoon. How many of you think you'd go? Hold your hand up. If you're not holding your hand up, you're lying. All right. So I want you to know that that would be a wonderful thing to get to go sit with King Charles. Yes. What Jesus was inviting them to was far more than sitting with a mere king of men. He was inviting them to sit at the table with the king of all kings and the Lord, come on, of all lords, that they get a chance to sit at the table. Can you imagine what that would be like. I, I, don't, I, I feel sorry for people who don't know what I know. Come on. I, I was flying a few weeks ago uh, on this airplane, which is normally the way I fly. And, um, and, and, and I was sitting on the airplane, uh, from, going from Atlanta to Portland, Oregon. And there was a couple sitting next to me, a young man sitting next to the window, young lady sitting in the middle seat. And I was on the aisle seat. And, and we were taking off and uh, he put his beats on, got his laptop out, and never stopped typing the entire flight, three and a half hours. His wife was chatting Kathy. She wanted to talk. And so you can tell I like to talk. And so we're just chatting back and forth. And I asked her, I said, what do you guys do? She said, we're executives with Apple Computers. And we're on our way to a conference out in Portland, Oregon. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, what, what all are you going to do in Portland? And she told me all they were going to smoke, all they were going to drink, all the people they were going to sleep with. And I'm just telling you, it was wicked as she looked at me and said those things out loud where everybody could hear it. And then she looked at me and said, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel. And she said, let me stop you right now and tell you I am an atheist. I do not believe in the God thing, and I don't want to hear about that stuff. And the Holy Spirit just gave me a quick word for her, and I said, well, I feel sorry for you. And she looked at me with her big brown eyes. 
She said, we're executives with Apple computers. We're wealthy people. Why would, and look at me with indignation in her eyes. She said, why would you feel sorry for me? I said, because you don't know who I know. And you don't know what I know. And she said, what does that mean? I said, can I tell you? And she said, yes. So I began to tell her about how God had changed my life. And, and when I was a 16-year-old boy, that alcohol was trying to get a grip in my heart, and my life was spiraling out of control. My family was falling apart, going through a very, very difficult time as our family. And a pretty girl in my school invited me to go to church. And I didn't go to church. There were no Christians in my family. But she was so pretty, I said, honey, I'll go anywhere with you, all right? And so I went to Moffett Road Baptist Church over here on Moffett Road as a 16-year-old boy 44 years ago, and I was sitting on the very back row of the church, and I wasn't listening to the preacher, but all of a sudden the minister said, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And it was like his finger went 60 feet to the back row where I was sitting, and it felt like he was poking me in my heart. Anybody know what I'm saying? And, and, And then he said this, and he said, God loves you, And God wants to help you. Now, I'd never heard that before, Pastor Brad. All I'd ever heard before I went to church was God is angry with you because of the way that you're living. I said, if God loves me and God wants to help me, I want that. So I got up from the back row and I came to the front and nobody was laughing at me. They gave me a standing ovation. And I heard people saying, there goes Johnny, there goes Johnny, because they knew what a mess my life was. And I want you to know that night I gave my life to Jesus and I haven't had a drink of alcohol in my mouth since that night. God changed everything for me, changed my whole family. I led my dad to Christ right after that. I led my mother to Christ right after that. I led my brother to Christ. I led two of my sisters to Christ. My brother's a Baptist preacher. Y'all pray for him, all right? And God changed my whole future in just one moment. And I'm sitting on this airplane, and I'm telling this girl about this. And then I pull out my phone, and I keep the, the pathway to heaven right here on my cell phone. And I keep the Roman Road Scriptures just right here so anyone can read the Word of God with me that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is death, but the gift, come on somebody, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his great love for us and that while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. And if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, come on, we can be saved. For with the heart we believe and we are justified, with our mouth we confess and we are saved, yes? And so I'm declaring this on this airplane to this girl after she told me all they were going to smoke, all they were going to drink, all the people they were going to sleep with. And she said, wow, you really believe this, don't you? I said, I don't believe this. I live by this. And I said, could I pray for you? And she said, knock yourself out. And so I said, could we hold hands? She said, do we need to? I said, well, it'll help. And so she joins hands with me. Her husband has his beats on. He's still typing feverishly, and I'm holding his wife's hand. And so I start praying, oh God, would you let this young lady know, God, that you love her and that you are real and that you want a real relationship with her and you want to touch her today on this flight in Jesus' name. About that time she pulled her hand away from me. She said, I felt something tingle in my hand. What was that? Did you play some trick? I said, no, that's the God you said you don't believe in trying to prove to you that he knows your name and he wants to help you. She turned to the window and didn't say another word to me. I didn't speak to her. She didn't speak to me the rest of the flight. And, and I didn't get to talk to her anymore after that, but I can guarantee you this. She did not have fun partying in Portland for three days. See, I want you to understand, Jesus is painting this picture for those that know Christ and those who don't, what it's going to look like that you're invited to this banquet. They went to three specific people and they invited them to this banquet with all of the butterball turkeys and the corn on the cob and the black-eyed peas and the fried okra and the cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that, and pecan pie and apple pie and tea and Coke and bread, and they all, the Bible says, had excuses. Everyone say excuses. Now, how many of you, would you be honest, have ever had somebody give you an excuse before and you knew they were giving you an excuse? Would you hold your hand up so I can see it? Okay. Can we be honest again? How many of you have ever given someone an excuse before and you knew you were giving them an excuse? Yes? What I'm about to tell you is a true story. This happened to me when I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school and uh, there was a young lady that was in my school that was just so beautiful. Every time she would walk by me in the hallway, my heart would just leap out of my chest. And it was just almost difficult to look at her because she was so pretty. 
and, and, and I wanted to date her, but, but uh, I really couldn't get her attention. So I found out she was going to be the freshman homecoming representative for our homecoming game. And how many of you know that's the big game of the year where the guys want that special date and the girls with those big old pregnant mum flowers and the guys get all dressed up. And, and so I, I carried her books to class for her. I sat with her in the cafeteria. I wrote her letters. I called her on the phone. I went by her house. I even sent her flowers. And finally, the big day came when she looked at me and she said, Johnny, would you please escort me across the field for our homecoming football game? And I said, yes, I'd love to. Because it was the first chance that I'd ever had to wear my three-piece blue corduroy suit. Now, can anybody remember the original bell bottoms, you know? Took five minutes for the back to catch up with the front, you know, with every step that you took. And even bell bottoms are back in style, God help us, all right? And so I had my brand new suit. Her name was Lynn Bradford, and, uh, and they called us out there at Ladd Memorial Stadium in downtown Mobile. We were playing our arch rival, Murphy. I was at Shaw High School, and at halftime, they called the homecoming court across the field. And they called out freshman first, and her name was Bradford. So, but, but it was almost like they said my name louder than anybody else's that night. It felt like it. It felt like they said Lynn Bradford, escorted by Johnny Jernigan in his three-piece blue corduroy suit. So I'm escorting her across the field, and we're having a wonderful time down at Ladd Stadium. And then after the game, we went to our gymnasium for our homecoming dance. And it was amazing. <laughs> my arms were around her. <laughs> And her arms were around me. Can everybody sway with me just a little bit? Come on, can you sway just a little bit? And we're just swaying to the music. And everything is so wonderful. And then all of a sudden, while we're dancing in the gymnasium, she said, Johnny, I have to tell you something. I said, well, what is it, Lynn? I thought it was going to be something sweet. She said, well, I have to tell you that. Well, I have to tell you that I can't go out with you anymore. I said, what do you mean, woman? You can't go out with me anymore. You got your big flower on. I got my brand new suit on. Why can't you go out with me again? She said, well, the reason is because, well, the reason is because I'm dying. I said, what? Yes, yes, I've got this thing growing on my brain. The doctors have only given me three months to live. I can't see you anymore. I can't talk to you anymore. I can't go out with you anymore. And she turned and ran to the girls' restroom at the end of the gymnasium. So I'm in a dead panic, Pastor Brad, because you don't normally hear somebody while you're dancing with them tell you that they're dying. So I chased her to the end of the gymnasium with all of her friends. I said, Liam, what are you talking about? She said, no, I can't go out with you anymore. I've got this thing growing on my brain. The doctors have only given me three months to live. I can't talk to you anymore. I can't go out with you anymore. For the next three months, I went by her house, and she never would come to the door. For the next three months, I called her on the phone. She wouldn't take any of my phone calls. For the next three months, I, 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 I wrote her letters. She didn't return any of my letters. And after six months... I noticed Lynn was still looking very, very healthy. And then I found out she was building a heavy-duty industrial strength relationship with one of the star football players on our football team. She dumped me with the excuse she was dying. Ladies, that's just a little bit drastic, all right? I mean, all she had to do was say, eat dirt and die, all right? I would have left her alone. But no, the heifer told me she was dying. And you got to know in my high school, heifer was a term of endearment. (laughs) And and, and, and this happened uh, 40 years ago, and I still see her here in Mobile sometimes, and I say, hey, Lynn, how do you feel today? (laughs) And she says, leave me alone. And and i got to be honest with you, I'm really glad I never married her. She's ugly as a mud fence, all right? I'm just telling the truth. The years have not been kind. That is a very true story that happened to me when I was in high school. I want you to get a picture of what happened at this banquet. Jesus is saying the price of salvation is paid. Everything will be prepared. I am going to take the place of humanity, go and invite everyone to come and sit at the banquet. They have a personal, handwritten, blood-covered invitation that they can sit at the table with the king. So they go to the first person and say, come on, man, you're invited to the banquet. 45-pound butterball turkey, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra, cranberry sauce, but you don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke, and bread and tea. And the first person said, well, I'd like to come, but I'm not going to be able to make it today. Uh, Please excuse me. I just bought five cows, and i got to go try them out. Please excuse me. Now, how many of you would buy a car you've never driven before? Don't raise your hand if you would. Uh, It's probably not a smart decision. It might be a little bit of Dane Bramage. 
uh, to buy a vehicle that you have not driven before. He said, please excuse me, I'm not going to be able to make it. So the servant goes, the Bible tells us to the second person, you're invited to the banquet, you get to sit with the king, you have an invitation. But the second person said, well, I'd like to come, but I, 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 I've got, I just bought a field and i got to go and see it, and, and I'm not going to be able to make it. Please excuse me, I'm not going to be able to get there. Now, how many of you would buy a piece of property that you've never looked at before? D don't raise your hand if you would. Probably a, a, a little bit of Dane Bramage, probably not a quality choice of a vehicle that you're trying, uh, or a piece of property you're trying to buy. So the servant, the Bible tells us, goes to the third person. Come on, man, 45-pound butterball turkeys, corn on the cob, black-eyed peas, fried okra. Cra Does anybody like cranberry sauce? But you don't have to eat that. Pecan pie, apple pie, Coke and bread and tea. And the third person said, I just got married. And my wife is making me clean the house, build a new addition to the house, and she's got me right there making me do all the things a married man has to do. And all the men said, there's a few brave ones, all right? There's a few brave ones. I want you to know that they all had an invitation to come and sit at the feast at the table with the king of kings. But the Bible says they were all had excuses. They were much more interested at staying home with their spouse. They were much more interested at looking at their property. And they were much more interested in going and seeing their newly acquired cattle. And I want you to know they made three fundamental mistakes in this passage of Scripture that still happens across our nation on a regular basis. And the only difference between you and me is perspective. As an evangelist, I'm in different cities every week across the country. I was in Texarkana, Texas last week. I'll be in Jasper, Alabama this coming next weekend. So I get to see a very broad look of America. And we're still making the same three mistakes that they made in this par parable that Jesus is teaching. Number one, we, our, our generation is making excuses. Everybody say excuses. The second mistake that they made was they had empty expectations. Empty expectations. Everybody say empty the third mistake that they made in this parable was they became the wrong example. Everyone say example. Number one, the Bible tells us that they all alike had excuses. Do you know the enemy is very, very good at whispering in our ear to lie to us and tell us that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we'll never have enough, we'll never be enough, God will never be able to use us because we fall down every time it seems like we get back up. Can anybody else ever heard those lies other than me? And the enemy is very, very good at whispering in our ear of using every dumb, silly excuse in our life to stop us from believing that God can do something great in our life. Satan, the Bible says, is the father of what? Lies. In other words, he is incapable of telling us the truth. See, I want you to understand. Somebody said, if, how do you know if the devil's lying, if his lips are moving? He doesn't have the ability to tell you the truth. And he's constantly whispering, especially at night when it's dark and it's late. The loud whispers of the enemy get in our ear and say, do you remember how many mistakes you've made? Do you remember how many lies you've told? Do you remember how many things you've done wrong? Do you know how many times you've taken those drugs? Do you know how many times you said you're going to quit drinking and you're still going back to that bottle? And he's very, very good. Come on. Am I the only one? He's very, very good at reminding us of our past mistakes. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to make excuses for allowing those things in our lives, yes? It was a young lady years ago, uh, I was the youth pastor over here at Knollwood, Assembly of God, and there was a family that came to our church from Montgomery, Alabama. It was the Jones family. They had a daughter named Jennifer who was just a champion of life. Her dad worked for IBM in, in Montgomery, big computer firm. That was before Microsoft and all of the great computers that we have today. But back in the 80s, was living in Montgomery working for IBM. Anybody remember IBM? And was working for that company and was a very, very wealthy man. He made a mistake on his job there, and it cost the company millions and millions of dollars. And they fired him from his job, and he became so depressed that he, it was, he could not even get up hardly. He was so depressed that it was hard for him to just function. So they decided they needed to leave Montgomery. They moved to Mobile, and when they did, the wife got a job, and their daughter, who was 15 at that time, got a job, and she was working at Ryan's Steakhouse. Anybody remember Ryan's Steakhouse? And she was such a champion of life. She was such a champion that she was making sometimes three and four hundred dollars a day in tips. That she would go after school and go to work. She uh, got a car. 
She graduated from high school. She went to the University of South Alabama and got an accounting degree. She married a young man who is a, an attorney. They live in Huntsville, Alabama today. And they're a very, very successful family. And God has blessed them all along the way. And you know what she did? She brought those tips again and again and again to her mom and dad. Said, this is to help pay the bills, mom and dad. I want to help. You know what Jennifer never did? She never blamed her daddy for what was going on in her life. She never blamed her mama. Because I hear people all the time say, well, the reason I'm the way I am is because of what my daddy did to me. The reason I'm the way I am is because of what my mama did to me. The reason I'm the way I am is what that teacher did to me. The reason I'm the way I am is because of what that pastor did to me. Can I tell you, when we stand before God, we're not going to be able to blame our mom or our dad or the pastor or the police. And we're not going to be able to use that as an excuse for the things that we do in our life. We're going to have to throw those excuses off and say, I'm not going to let that stop me anymore from believing I can be a champion for God and I can know the things of God and I can, God can use me. Yes? The enemy is very, very good at using excuses of our past and the mistakes we've made. And there's not one person in this room, or if you're watching online, that we wish we couldn't go back and change some of the decisions we've made. Yes? Unfortunately, you can never go back. The only thing we can do is start right now moving forward to say, God, I'm not going to let the excuses. Because, see, I want you to understand that the Bible says their excuses stop them from feasting at the table with the king. Yes? The second mistake they made in this parable, not only did they have excuses, the Bible said they had empty expectations. It infers that they had very little expectation about what this banquet was going to be like. See, we think we've got this whole thing figured out in church. Can y'all scoot over just a little bit and just let me have just a little bit of room there? See, we think we got this whole church thing figured out. We, we, we come in here, and I see this all over the country, and we come in, and, and, and we sing some songs, and then we pray, and we make some announcements, and then we take the offering, because there's three things you can count on in life. That's life and death, and the offering will be taken in church. Hallelujah. And then we're going to preach like I am right now, and then I, we, we invite people to the altar. We know at the end of the service, we're going to invite people to an encounter at the altar of God. And I watch this all over the country, that people just start dragging to the altar. <laughs> like, dear God, how long do we have to be in here today, God? <laughs> Can you make that little fat preacher shut up, God? Make, make him shut up, God. How long is this going to last? And then you know what we do? We jump up and we skip out and we're ready to go through the rest of the day for what we're doing. And see, we have that look on our face like some of you got this on your face right now. How long do we have to be here? How long is this service going to last? Listen, we watch movies for hours. Come on, somebody. This generation binge watches 30 episodes on Netflix in this generation, yes? We watch games for hours. What is wrong with staying in the house of God for an extended period of time? The problem is we have such little expectation that anything significant is going to happen because here's what we say to God. God, you can do anything you want to in my life as long as you can finish by 1130. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And see, because they had such little expectation, obviously, from this banquet, they really didn't think there was much. They would rather see their cattle. They would rather stay with their property. They'd rather stay home with their spouse than feasting at the table with the king of kings. I want you to know, what you ex if you expect nothing, you'll get it every time. Nothing. But if you can expect a God who loves you to heal you, he's still a God who heals. If you can expect a God who can deliver your family, He's still a God who can deliver. If you're going to believe in a God who can provide for you in every issue of life, he's still a God of provision. Does anybody remember uh, Benny Hinn? Wave at me if you remember Benny Hinn. Those that might not know him, he was a great healing evangelist back in the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. He doesn't do that anymore, and it's for a very good reason. If you'd like to know after the service, I'll explain it to you. But he had great, great healing miracles in his crusade. And I'll never forget, he came to Mobile uh, back in the uh, late 80s, and Karen and I had a chance to go down to the Mobile Civic Center. Anybody remember that meeting? He came to Mobile, and there were 10,000 people in the Mobile Civic Center. And I'll never forget it, all the people had driven from hundreds and hundreds of miles to be in this Benny Hinn healing crusade. And regardless of what you think of Benny Hinn, let me just tell the story. And, and so... 
Karen and I are sitting on the minister's section, and there's a, a woman and her son sitting in front of us, a mother and her son, and he had a breathing oxygen tank next to him, and he had a breathing mask on, and we heard him talk about his cystic fibrosis, and you could hear every breath this child took, just <laughs> You could hear every breath that he took. Benny Hinn wasn't even on the platform. There was a 400-voice choir up on the platform, and they were just singing the songs of faith. And I'll never forget, she put her arm around her little boy, and we heard her say this. She said, they, they were from Baton Rouge. That's four hours away. She said, son, we've driven four hours for a miracle, and we're not leaving without a miracle. Benny Hinn wasn't even on the platform, but there was such expectation in her heart. She was believing that God could meet her son's need. So they were singing that great song of the church. Then sings, my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Can you sing it? How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And the next voice you heard was Benny Hens. He stepped out on the platform and he said, the, the Lord is present to heal. The Lord is present to heal. And he started calling out different diseases. And then he called out cystic fibrosis. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. The little boy ripped his mask off in front of us. He said, Mama, Mama, I think it's me. I feel something burning. I think it's me. So he took off running in front of 10,000 people. His mama took off running right behind him. And I took off running right behind her. I wanted to see what God was going to do. And Bibby he had called this little boy up on the platform, and he said, what is God doing for you, son? And I'll never forget it. He said, I can breathe, Pastor Benny. For the first time in my life, I can breathe and Benny Hinn laid his hand on that boy, and he fell on the platform under what we call falling under the power of God in a miracle moment. And I said, God, are you really healing this boy, or is this just some Pentecostal charismatic thing we do so that people will get excited? Yes? So I followed that boy the rest of that night. I didn't let him get out of my sight. And can I tell you, he left that place. He left the oxygen tank and his breathing mask in the minister's seating section. He left that place dancing and leaping for joy like everybody every time when Jesus healed somebody and changed his life. Come on, somebody shout to God for that. Hallelujah. Now, can I tell you this? I believe it, it, it had very little, if nothing, to do with Benny Hinn. I believe it had everything to do with a mother's expectation that said, God, if nobody else gets a miracle, if nobody else gets your help, if nobody else gets set free, if nobody else sees your hand move, God, do it in me, yes? That there's a story of a persistent widow in the Bible that she came to a judge and she just wouldn't stop and she wouldn't stop and she wouldn't stop until that judge said, for goodness sake, would somebody give that persistent widow what she wants? Yes? yes. Nothing times nothing is if you expect it, you get it every time. But if you'll believe God can heal your family, God can heal your family. If you'll believe that God can provide for you, God can provide for you. If you believe God can bless your business, God can bless your business. Obviously, they just didn't expect very much. They just had very little expectation about this banquet because they would have rather stayed with their spouse. They would have rather stayed with their property. They'd rather stay with their cattle. The third mistake that they made in this parable, not only did they have excuses, not only did they have empty expectations, but Jesus, as he's painting this picture, the Bible tells us they became the wrong example. The Bible uses this little throwaway phrase. It says, they lost their place at the banquet. Wow, just a little throwaway line. They lost their place at the banquet. Does that mean that they lost it for an hour? Does that mean they lost it for a day? Does that mean they lost it for a year? The inference is they lost it forever. We as Americans are so time conscious what was given to us by our great, British, great Britain and, and our British friends, they gave us that concept of time. We keep everything by the watch. Let me try very quickly just to paint a picture for you for forever. Forever is a long time. Forever would be like a bird that would fly down here to Gulf Shores, Alabama, and grab one grain of sand in its beak. 
And it turns and flies all the way to Los Angeles, California, with that one little grain of sand in its beak. Would everybody fly with me to California? Come on. And it drops that grain of sand on the beaches of Los Angeles, California, there at Long Beach, California. And then it turns and flies all the way back to Gulf Shores. Would everybody fly back to Gulf Shores with me? Come on. That's a wounded bird right there, all right? You only got one wing up, all right? And he grabs one more grain of sand in his beak, and he turns and flies back to Los Angeles. Can you indulge me? Come on, can anybody fly with me one more time? By the time that bird removes every grain of sand from the beaches of Gulf Shores, Alabama, onto the beaches of Long Beach, California, and Los Angeles, by the time that bird removes every grain of sand one at a time, flying back and forth across the country, and by the time every grain of sand is removed onto those beaches, that is the beginning of eternity. Eternity is a long time. Eternity in hell will be longer. So what happened at the banquet? They, they had excuses. They had empty expectations. And the Bible shows us they became the wrong example because they lost their place at the banquet. And, and here's what it says. The, 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 the master became angry. And he ordered the servants, he said, quickly go out to the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So they go out there, the Bible infers in this parable, and they bring them in. And, and, and their hair is bad, their breath is bad, they're dirty. They bring them in and sit them down because there was room at the banquet table. Like we got a few empty chairs here today. And they bring them in and set them down at this great banquet but then there's still room. And then the master makes this amazing statement, go into the highways and hedges and compel them. Everybody say compel. Come on, shout it loud, compel. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. The word compel is a very, very strong word in that passage, and it means this. Do whatever is necessary to influence others for my kingdom. Do whatever is necessary to persuade others for my kingdom. Do whatever is necessary to convince them that they need to come to the kingdom of God. Yes? See, you might know, not know all the theology of God's word, but everybody can do what I'm about to show you right now. See, the Bible says go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Will you come help me, young man? Would you bend over my head? And he said, go get them and bring them in to the house of God so that the house of God will be full. Everybody say full. Come on, shout it, Full. One of the things that Jesus wanted was he wanted his house full. See, you might not know all the theology of God's word, but every person can do what I'm showing you right now. Can you come help me, young man? Yeah, can you come help me? The Bible says go get them and compel them. Would you bend over my shoulder? And he said, go get them and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Yes, and you don't just have to go for the small ones. You can go for the big ones too. Hallelujah. Because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Hallelujah. Come on. You just walk. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. All right, listen. And the Bible says go out and get them and compel them to come in so that the house of God will be full. Yes? I was in Askewville, North Carolina, on the Outer Banks many years ago. And I've always taught as an evangelist to bring people to Christ. And there was a woman who came to me and, 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 and told me her story of what God had done. And the pastor verified this story. That one day the pastor was preaching and, and, uh, and he said this in the service. He said, God can heal anybody. God can change anybody. God can help anybody no matter what they've done. Do we believe that? And her son was a crack addict. Every night passed out in front of their television from crack cocaine. And she was sick of what was happening to her son. And she left that service that day, went home, and her son was laying in front of the television again, passed out from the drugs that he had taken the night before. And she was so desperate for a miracle that she said she tied his hands up, she tied his feet up, and she drug him out to the back seat of her car. She drove to the church for the evening service. When she got to the church, she came through the side door, dragging this boy into the sanctuary with his hands and his feet tied and laid him right in front of the pulpit where the pastor was already preaching. And he looked at her and said, what are you doing? She said, you said this morning God can heal anybody. I'm sick of what drugs are doing to my boy, and I've got to have a miracle. And being a loving pastor like Pastor Brad and Pastor Mary, 
He called the worship team up and they began to sing the songs of the blood. They began to sing the songs of the cross. They began to sing the songs of the name of Jesus. And after 30 minutes of them singing over this boy, the power of God touched him. He got saved. He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he is an Assemblies of God preacher in North Carolina today while you and I are sitting in this room right now. Come on, somebody. You want to know why? Because his mother drug him to the house of God and said, God, if nobody else gets it. Now, I'm not advocating that we gag and tie people and that we bring them into the house of God. But what I am advocating, God, here's my friend. And I love my friend. God, please don't let my friend go to hell. I brought him to church this morning. Anoint Pastor Brad. Let the word of God touch him. Set him free. God, change his life. God, here's my brother from another mother. Hallelujah. And he's bigger than I am. But God, we're built just alike. And God, I just pray you bless him. Don't let him go to hell. I brought him to church this morning. Please anoint Pastor Brad. Don't let him go to hell. Change his life. You say, God, here's here's my dad. And I love you, dad. God, here's my dad. I love you, dad. You need to shave. All right. God, touch my dad and change his heart, change his life. I brought him to church this morning, God. Will you anoint Pastor Brad so that my dad can get saved today? And listen to me. One friend at a time, one family member at a time, one neighbor at a time. If we'll drag them in to the house of God, and get them under the preaching of Pastor Brad. The power of God will touch them. The power of God will change them. The power of God will set them free. Do we believe that? Would you give these guys a great big hand for helping me? Hallelujah. Can somebody come to the piano? Because that's when we know the service is over. Hallelujah. Let me show you something very quick before we pray. The Bible says they had excuses What excuse is stopping you? Is the enemy holding up your past to you today? God wants to break your past off of you today. And he wants you to walk out a new creation. That no matter what mistakes are in your past, God says, I can make all things new. That today can be the the, the beginning of the rest of your life. And the rest of your life can be the best of your life. Because you say, I'm throwing the excuses off of me. And I'm not going to make excuses for that anymore. Look at me. July 22nd, 1979, as a 16-year-old boy, when God set me free from alcohol. I haven't had a drink of alcohol since that time. And I've never made excuses for it because I, I just believe that what, whom the sun sets free, come on, is free indeed. And I found out there's no high like the most high. There's no pill like the gospel. All right. There is nothing but Jesus. And he is everything that I have ever needed in every issue of my life. What's holding on to you today? What chain is holding you back? God brought you here today, and we're so honored that you're in the house of God, and it is my honor that we get to be together, but I have to tell you the truth. This thing is winding up. The end of time is close. I don't believe we're in the last days. I believe we're in the last minutes of the last days. I was in Chattanooga just a few months ago, and the Holy Spirit just began to groan through me as I was preaching there. And I've only had this happen twice in all of my years of ministry. The Holy Spirit began to groan through me and he said this, he said, it's almost too late. It's almost too late. It's almost too late. It'll be like it was in the days of Noah that men will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage and they won't even know what's happened until the flood comes and takes them all away. Open the door, Noah. Let us in, Noah. But it'll be too late. Listen to me, church. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to put fear. I'm just trying to tell you it's almost too late. And the ark is closing. And if you're going to get on the ark, you better get on right now. Because the Bible promises a lot, but it doesn't promise tomorrow. You may never have another chance to sit like this. What excuse is holding you back? Throw it off today and say, God, I believe that you can heal me. Would you bow your heads with me? Nobody looking around for just a moment. Father, would you begin to speak to men and women all over this room? Would you speak to boys and girls? Would you speak to those watching online? And ever, whatever lie, God, if they can't get free of their past addictions, let them throw that off today and be set free. If they can't get free from their past family issues, let them throw that off and get set free today. If they can't get free from the mistakes that they've made along the way, let them throw that off today and be set free. Come on, if you're a Christian, I need you to pray right now. Somebody's life is in the balance. Young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here today, I want to ask you a question. If you died today, do you know that you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? It's a really, really important question. 
And everybody's going to have to answer this question whether we think we will or not. So if, would you ask yourself right now, God, if today was my last day on this planet, do I know that I know that I know that I'd be in heaven with Jesus? See, you can fool me today because I'm pretty easy to fool. You can fool your friends. You can fool your neighbors. You can fool your pastors. You might even fool the police, but I can tell you this, you'll never fool God. He loves you. He made you, but He made you to be free. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you, ask yourself, God, are you talking to me? You're the only person I'm talking to right now. You're the only person that I'm talking to right now. If that's you anywhere in this room, and you say, you know what, Brother Johnny, there are some things in my life that are not right, and I'm not sure if I died, I would go to heaven. And I don't want to play games with my eternity. I want to make sure that heaven is my home. Would you pray for me? Pray, Christian, somebody's life. You, everybody Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. And the Lord's calling somebody in this room right now. Young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here today. And he's saying, run to me and I'll show you rest. Run to me and I'll show you life. Run to me and I'll show you a new beginning. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not asking you to join this church. This is an amazing church. I'm asking you to join the kingdom of God and to come close to Jesus today. In Jesus' name. Would you look at me real quick? I wasn't going to share this, but I think I shared this the last time I was here. But I really felt the Lord prompted me to say this. When I was a little boy, my daddy told me all the time, he said, boys, don't play football in the house. How many of you know sometimes boys do things they're not supposed to do? And I was, a ten, I was 10 years old. My brother was six. And he said, don't play football in the house. And my dad was outside cutting the grass. And I'll never forget while he was outside cutting the grass, I saw the football over on the couch. And I reached over and got it and threw it across the room to my baby brother. And I threw it too hard and it went through his hands and broke my dad's favorite lamp that he had gotten from his grandmother. And I knew I was in trouble. Who knows what I'm talking about? So I told my baby brother, I said, quick, Scotty, go lock the door. So my brother went over and locked the door and we started picking up the glass and the lawnmower cut off. And my daddy came to the door and he tried to come in, but it was locked. And he said, open the door, boys. But I knew what was coming. And I said, Daddy, I, I, I can't open the door. He said, open the door, boys. And, and who knows what I'm talking about? I knew what was coming. I said, Daddy, I can't open the door. And he said, whatever you've done is going to be twice as bad if you don't open this door right now. Anybody ever heard that voice before? And I opened the door. My daddy came in. And he saw the football sitting in the middle of all the glass. And he pulled his belt off. <laughs> And I'm telling you, he wore me out. You know why my daddy beat me that day? Because I opened the door. If I'd have kept that door locked, he'd still be outside. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you why some of you are losing? You've opened the door. Throw the excuses off today. Throw the excuses off today and run to Jesus. Will you bow your heads? Father, would you speak to every person in this room? Would you deliver every heart in this room? And would you make all things new in a way that only you can in Jesus' name? If that's you anywhere in this room, young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here today, and you say, Brother Johnny, I'm not where I should be with God. There are things in my life that are wrong. And I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven, but I want to know that. Would you please include me in that final prayer? Pray, Christian, somebody's life is in the balance. If that's you, no, but this is not between you and the person on your right and left. This is not between you and the person in front of you and behind you. This is between you and God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this room, you say, I know it's me, Brother Johnny. I can fool everybody else, but there are things in my life that are not right, and I need to get closer to God today. Would you pray for me? If that's you anywhere in this room, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up, shove it down the devil's throat, and say, I'm not going to let the excuses stop me anymore. I'm not going to live the way I've been living. I'm going to run to Jesus to get free. If that's you, young lady, no matter who's around you, if you say, I know it's me, I can fool everybody else, but I know I can't fool God, I need to get closer to him today. Include me in that final prayer. If that's you, when I count to three, raise your hand right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Here we go. When I count to three, you raise it. One, two, three. Raise it right now. Get my attention. Yes, yes, yes. I see you, ma'am. I see you, ma'am. Come on, keep it raised. I see you, young man. I see you, young man. I see you, young lady. I see you, young man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, young lady, you can put your hands down. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one who comes close to Christ. I'm going to ask one more time. Come on, Christians, pray. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, but you know you should have with these other six or seven or eight people, and you said, you know what, I'm not where I should be with God, and I should have raised my hand. 
They're screaming in hell right now, begging us to listen. It's too late for those in hell. You may never get this chance again. You may never be this close to the kingdom of God. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, but you know that God is speaking to your heart, I need to get closer to Jesus. Include me in that final prayer. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, when I count to three, raise it right now. If there was even an inkling in your heart that things are not right with you and God, I wouldn't leave this building without getting it right. You may never get another chance. What if it was a horrible automobile accident or a tornado or, or, or a drive-by shooting? I'm begging you, if you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, if I could do it for you, I would. If that's you, you say, Brother Johnny, I should have raised my hand. I don't want to go to hell. I want to make sure heaven's my home. Pray for me. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, when I count to three, raise it right now. Shove it down the enemy's throat. Here we go. One, two, three. Raise it now. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you, man. Anybody else? Get my attention. I see you, man. I see you, ma'am. Boy, I'm glad I asked again. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Father, I've done everything you told me to do today. Now, Lord, I pray you give the increase, help me decrease, and let your will be accomplished in this room right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would everybody stand with me, please, for just a moment? Nobody leaving. Pastor will come, and he'll dismiss us in just a few moments. And we're going to pray over you that those chains are broken, and you're walking out changed and healed and set free today. God can do it. Those of you that raised your hands just a moment ago, the first step was to raise your hand. The second step was to publicly stand for Jesus. Jesus was crucified publicly, buried publicly, and resurrected public, publicly. We're going to have to stand for him publicly. 44 years ago, sitting on the back row of a Baptist church over at Moffat Road, I had to come publicly, and nobody laughed at me. Can I tell you, nobody's going to laugh at you in this room. We're going to give you a standing ovation. Is that right, church? Because we know what God can do in your heart right now. And here's what I want to do. I want to ask every person in this room, would you turn and look at someone close to you? Just turn and look at them and say, if you need to go up there and get closer to Jesus, I'll go with you. Would you just turn and ask someone that question right now? Just turn and ask them that question. And those of you that raised your hands, or if you didn't, then you should have, they're already coming right now. I know where you're sitting. You know who you are. You know where you are. You know where you are. Every person that raised their hand, would you come right now? Come on. Would you come right now? Every person that raised their hand. Come on. Can you clap for them, church, till they all get here? Can you clap for them until they all get here? Come on. Can you clap for them until they all get here? Hallelujah. Come on, church. Will you clap for them? There's still some others. I'm waiting for you. You come, you come, you come. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Pastor Mary, let her sit next to you, and we're going to pray in a minute. If you've got a family member or a friend up here, would you come stand with them? If you've got a family member or a friend, would you just come very quickly and stand with them? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to invite everybody else in the building now. Would you come and stand behind them? We're going to build a wall of prayer right behind these right now. Would everybody just step out of your seat for just a moment? We're going to close the prayer right here around the altar. Hallelujah. 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 Can everybody just step in here? We're going to pray for you in just a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Can you just step out of your seat? Just come. We're going to build a wall of prayer behind you. We're going to build a wall of hope behind you. Hallelujah. Look at me, man of God. Look at me. Your life is not behind you. It's in front of you. Are we so proud of this man? Come on, church. Today's a new beginning. Today's a new beginning. Let me tell you something. I've been fighting for you. And I want you to know, man, I've been praying and I'm so proud of what God is doing in your family. Look at me. How old are you? I was 16 when I gave my life to Christ. I wish I'd done it earlier. I wasted a lot, a lot years of my life. But today God says he'll make you a whole new creation. Just like you hold my hand, you can hold his. And maybe God is about to use you in a way that you never thought possible that this is your time. When you raise your hand over there, sweetheart, it was like God's hand was coming over you and saying, I can wash it all away. I can wash everything behind her away, every pressure away, every anxiety and all the pressure that you feel today, God says he can throw that off of you and you can walk out a new creation. Look at me. Hallelujah. God wrote you in his heart before you were ever born. He knew your name. Before you were ever born, he said, I, before you were ever in your mother's womb, he said, I knew you. And he's been waiting for you to sell out. Today is sellout day. You've heard some of these things, but today is the day to say everything, God. You've given him this much. He wants everything, yes? And if you'll give him everything, sweetheart, 
He'll say, I'll throw it all off of you and you'll walk out a new creation. Hallelujah. Those look at me right now that today's the day that God says, once for all, look at me, sweetheart, but once and for all, you're going to finish the song. You're going to finish the song and you're going to be what God's called you to be. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you that let me tell you that when you took a step toward God, He took two toward you. He knows where you are today, and He's here to set you free. Would everybody stretch your hands toward these? And would everybody pray this prayer out loud, those that came forward? Or if you did, uh, that, that if I didn't look at you, that today God's saying, be free of your past and walk out a new creation. I want to lead you in a prayer. So would everybody bow your head? Would everybody pray this prayer? If you're watching online, you pray this prayer with us. Come on, everybody pray it with me. Come on, say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know it was my sins that nailed you on that cross. And I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I deserve death but I ask for your life. I say with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the resurrected Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I give you my past, all of my mistakes, all of my hurt, all of my pain, all of my sin. I start over today, a child of God, and I receive you now as my only Lord, as my only hope, as my only way to heaven. You died for me, Jesus. Help me live for you now for the rest of my days. No more excuses. Come on, say it where the devil can hear you. No more excuses. Come on, say it again. No more excuses. Father, we want to throw off every weight that's behind us. Come on, stretch your hands toward them. And those that are close enough, just touch them on the shoulder. God, everything that trips them, everything that tries to hinder them, everything that tries to derail them, loose them, powers of hell. Loose them, powers of hell. They are no longer the property <coughs> of what they were when they came in this building, but they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So God set them free, break the chains, and let them sell out and say, Pastor Brad, Pastor Mary, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to be what God's called me to be. No more excuses. Come on, shout it. No more excuses. Come on, shout it. No more excuses. And Father, we claim them now as the property of Jesus Christ. And today is a new beginning in February of 2024 that they're a new creation in Jesus' name. Now, come on, can somebody clap for these that prayed that prayer today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for sharing the ministry of Search Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you. Stay connected together. We will surge.